of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. Our guest is Marticia Palmer. Marticia Palmer is the person behind the person. When she isn't the person, we see. She'll explain all of that later in the show. Marticia trained classically at London's Central School of Speech and Drama, as well as with specialists in Rome and New York. She's been in film, television, and the theater. But she's unique in that her career includes voiceovers, revoicing, and looping for film. And she's the voice we hear but don't see on radio and television. Let's start, Marticia, with an explanation of all three of those techniques. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of intriguing, Joan, because there's, there's now um, different terminology. But when I started doing this, I was a very young actress in Rome, Italy. And because I had a facility with languages, I mean, you had to, I mean, to survive, um, I, and I had French and Italian, I got called in as a young actress uh, to work and to redo um, some people like Vernalisi, for instance, some of the great Italian stars in English. And then they would use me in Italian and French. Now, we called it, if you were doing background, we called it dubbing. They don't uh, use that term here anymore. Right, dubbing. Yeah. Now they, but revoicing is if you're actually revoicing a character. Here now in the States, they call it looping. And that's usually for all the other voices that you're doing, character voices in the background, uh, uh, interesting uh, additions that the director may want to give the uh, texture to the film. I guess they, that's the way they call it. So yeah. if you d did a voiceover too, what would that, would that count on radio? Is that called a voiceover? You're absolutely right. And that's a very good differentiation because revoicing would be revoicing a particular character. Looping would be doing all the rest and the various bits and pieces on a film. Whereas revoicing, uh, voicing, uh, voiceover. vo voiceovers, which you just said, well, could be anything. It could be a narration. Uh, uh. It could be um, a radio spot. It could be anything that's broadcast, basically. Say mm. you're re revoicing something because it, uh, and you have to clarify what somebody said. Is that the idea? No, if you're revoicing, you would <coughs> have to lip sync and match what the lead character is doing. During the whole, through the whole movie? Through the whole movie. For instance, I did a series um, not too long <sighs> ago called The Exile for Stephen J. Cannell. And uh, they wanted a lot of different accents. I mean, I did Midwestern, Russian, French, depending on what the character was, and different age ranges. Uh, you know, to, the, to fit, and also sometimes to help out the, the uh, uh, character if they felt that it was a little bit weak or something could be, mm, that you could benefit, and you could, uh, you could benefit the character and add a little bit more depth to it. Would you do that voice thing in another language? Could you do that? Oh, sure. Yeah, I've done narrations in Italian for everything from aerospace, or I've done a lot of what they called, uh, well, what we call looping here in Italy. Tons of different films. In fact, they have a, that's a major career for some people. I was theatrically trained, of course, and then went on and did a lot of on-camera work, but a lot of people in Italy, uh, fine actors, are major voices for one particular person. You went for, talking about that, <laughs> you went for an audition today. Do you audition for this revoicing? Uh, Sometimes you do, and sometimes they just know your work and they call uh. you because you can know a lot of things. No, this today was a commercials, and, and actually one was a voiceover, you're right. And then, yes. but, but do they call a few people in and you read it the way they, they want to? They call you? usually many, many people in. And so what you do is you go in the audition, you give it your best shot, you enjoy it, and then you forget about it. I see. And then once in a while, you know, you're called and you, you're booked or whatever. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things is when, when you talked about revoicing, you did uh, Jackie Kennedy's voice for JFK. Yes, I, I did a little bit. It was very difficult to match because she doesn't, if it were just uh, classical British, it would have been much easier. But she has an, a curious oh. mixture. What'd you do? How'd you breathy. do it? 
Oh, well, you study. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to, no, you're not going to tempt me now, because it was a very unique, unusual quality, but it's breathy, a little bit a la Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. and also, but there's a touch of Boston, mm -hmm. and strangely enough, a touch of New York in a very sort of upscale way. So you analyze what so you're So you go through it and you practice and you do, you do different sounds. The other, there are three things that I thought were really fascinating. Baryshnikov's kiss in Giselle. <laughs> How do you, what is that? <laughs> you know, I, uh, that is, that I just put because I thought, you know, sometimes it gets so tiring to read resumes. <laughs> and so I, I just added some of the things that I've done are, that are sort of fun. And uh, I just seemed to be the only one who could match his kisses. It was as simple as that. You mean with noise? Yes. Uh, how do you, you know, do like that? A, mm. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, then in, in Godfather 3? Godfather 3, we had a lot of Sicilian. And so we had a lot of scenes where they wanted a lot of texture. Do you remember the, the opera house and the, the singing oh, and all of that? Yes. That was a major scene that had to have a lot of uh, different voices and sounds and elegant upscale and some peasant and some. So you had to be able to, uh, it could have, some of it was in French, some of it was in Did Sicilian. you do all of it? I worked you on did all different of it. sounds many, from yes. different voices, different people, different yes. ages. Really? Yes. So you just go into the studio and watch and the film. Watch the film, and either I myself alone or a group of us, who are equally adept at uh -huh. this kind of thing, you know, ah. work on it. Yeah. But I was trained classically, so I always feel that's my, gra you know, my foundation, because when you when you have when you've worked in theater, I think it's. It's kind of like a lifeblood, and then you can go off and you do film, and you you love to do it all. But at the same time, you feel that you have I, I don't know how to. It's sort of like roots. I guess mm. that's the way I feel. Well, talking about doing the Godfather, when you were in Rome, you translated the Pope's speeches into <laughs> English or into Italian. I don't know what language you translated them. You're right. In this case, <laughs> it was from Italian into English. And it was, a, it was curious the way that happened because I was working for Italian television and doing programs in Italian, French, English, whatever, you know, was required. Oh, I would interview groups like the Who's or the Hollies or else I would do uh, <laughs> their equivalent of a soap with, uh -huh. let's say, Giancarlo Giannini, uh, something called Squarciagola. And, and they called me up one day and one of the directors said, would you please go over to the Vatican? They need an announcer. So I thought, well, an announcer, you know, I was a little bit hesitant about this because I, it seemed very um, impressive, you know, and I went over and there was a wonderful Irish priest and he said, uh, just, just go into the other room, my child, and just sit there and <laughs> translate these few things. Well, it was one of the papal speeches. I was absolutely <laughs> terrified. <laughs> it was very abstract, you know, it's a very, and I did, and I was, I was literally sweating like a horse and I came out of there and then he looked at it and he said, go on the air. Oh, you went on the air and did it? Yes. Oh, yes. I always was on the air. And so I With went... With your translation? Yeah. Weren't you nervous yeah. about what the critics would say? She missed a word or she didn't have the right inflection? I was. I was, <laughs> I was, I was properly and rightly so, I was nervous. But I was very pleased because they called up and wanted to know who the young nun was who was working there. So. Well, that was a compliment. <laughs> that was a compliment. <laughs> Before we go any further, talking... Um, Let's talk about characterization or how you would approach something. I think you have a script or something like that where you can show us the different techniques yes. from your backgrounds. Well, it, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people have a specific idea about how a character should be approached. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any one way. I don't think there's a wrong way or a right way. And even though I was classically trained in London, I worked in New York and and I had a certain amount of the method mm -hmm. instilled in me. But I always remember sitting in a session at the actor's studio and watching wonderful actress Ellen Burstyn. And one of the students asked her, I had just finished doing a play there, and one of the students said, what is the first thing that gives you the breakthrough to the character? And of course I expected her to say this in her life and so on, we were all hanging on her words, and her answer was, the clothes, the dress. Ah, oh. And I thought that was so interesting because it put everything in perspective so that for me. Is because it's very different for everybody. Some person it might be the, the sound of the, the, the voice or, or the business, mm -hmm. the actual physical life of the character. Right. Uh, and so there's, no, there's not really just um, one way. But I was coaching uh, a young actress recently and um, it was very interesting to see how there's a kind of natural intuition that everybody has and 
she started working not from voice, um, but from the physical life of the character. Mm. And it was very interesting what would happen as she uh, used, for, for instance, a, a, a cigarette case in this case and was working with that. Something started to come alive in an attitude. And so I went with that because I could see she was very physically oriented. And out of that, all these wonderful things started to come. Although I have to tell you, you can use anything. I was doing Gertrude once in Hamlet up at uh, North Shore uh -huh. Theater near Boston. And the Hamlet was very young and very attractive. And so there was a lot of sort of slightly incestuous quality. And um, when he throws me down over the bed, my pearls fell, not just fell off, but they came apart. So as I did the rest of the scene, I had to pick up these pearls oh. from the floor, and I used it, and it was wonderful. But back to that physical thing that you were talking about, yes. and when you talked about the girl using something in her hand, it was yes. uh, back to the dressing, or back to that appearance thing again. And now isn't that, isn't that isn't odd? Isn't that the way? Yes, because you would think the inner life is so important, but then you can go over a script and you can read something, and it have no meaning the first time or it just sounds like words, and then you begin to see there's this, there's a feeling coming out, there's an inner life somewhere, there's something that's triggered off, and you don't have to force it, or it may feel forced the first two times, and then something starts to happen, and it's so, it's like a, it's a voyage. Do you th see yourself as teaching eventually at the end of your career, or in the middle, or? You know, I think teaching is something that I love to do, so it's always there. I mean, yesterday I was coaching, the day before I was uh, auditioning, the, uh, you know, two days before that I was revoicing, and then I was auditioning for a movie, so y you know, you, you just never know what it's going to be. Yeah. And before we leave, uh, tell us a little bit about what kind of a personal life you can have with all of these different things you've got going. <laughs> well, I try to keep my personal life as, as relaxed as possible uh -huh. because um, I like to save the drama for my acting. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, God knows, you know, life can be uh, complicated enough. So hopefully, you know, you want to keep some kind of center and have wonderful friends and keep a sense of humor because you're called for so many different strange things. And, and you want to enjoy the, the trip, you know, as you're, you want to enjoy, enjoy the journey. That's my feeling. Well, we enjoyed the journey that you took us on today. I think it was wonderful. And thank you so much for being with us. I think you really opened our eyes to see how many different aspects are related to what you were doing, just one person. Thank you so much, Joan. I enjoyed being here with you. Thanks, Marticia. And thanks for being with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with George Zorich, our guest for this segment. George was born in Moscow and raised in Lithuania. At the age of 11, he started dance studies at the Cosno Opera Ballet School. Since he was doing so well, his mother took him to Paris to study. And at 18, he was dancing with Colonel de Basil's Ballet Russe. That was the beginning of an exciting career. It seems that dancers get started much earlier. In, it seemed that they got started much earlier in those days. George, is that true? Well, Joan, yes, they have to be flexible. Uh, well, when at the university they start at 16, the body has already grown stiffer, and uh, one has to start by 16, 18, one is at the very top, or, and then they perhaps become uh, soloists or uh, leading dancers in the company, stars. Is that what happened with you? I mean, your career took off within seven or eight years. You were already on the stage with major dancers. Well, I don't know how it happened, but <laughs> I, I guess it was lucky. After my first class, when I took uh, in, Co in Lithuania from Mr. Petrov, Pavel Petrov, uh, many students surrounded me and asked me what I studied before. And that was my very first class. Is that right? So I was fortunate somehow. Do you I was think it limber. was? I, I was somehow uh, had you been the right person for the ballet. Had you been around dancers before? No. 
Your family, your father? I saw one performance, ballet performance, and I was so enthused about it that I started to hop around the house and in order to save the furniture and china. <laughs> <laughs> my mother decided to talk to the ballet master, the choreographer of the ballet company at the opera, and uh, he said, why don't you bring your son over to the class? So many of those schools are called um, opera ballet. Do they teach opera as well, or is it just... Uh... No, it's un, in, under one roof, uh, the opera and the ballet company. And then, of course, the opera perhaps uh, employs also the dancing in certain operas. So it's uh, under the same roof. Did you learn to sing? You don't well, do... Well, later on for Broadway shows, yes. But it wasn't at the school? No, at no, the no. School. Th that had nothing to do. Um, Leonid Massin was um, one of your great backers, should well, we say, or interested in your work? Yes, Tamara Tumanova. Uh, she's the one who brought the attention of mine to Mr. Massin. And I remember uh, the audition I did, I, I felt like I did so bad. I was just so nervous. And the uh, next moment he said, well, go up the next uh, the stair and see uh, Kellendel de, de Basil. And he an ha and handed me a two-year contract. Is that when you first got started? Yes. Was Massine older, a lot older than you? Uh, yes, yes, but uh, he's a genius choreographer. He lived the very... The greatest, greatest choreographer uh, this world has ever had. He lived to a very nice old age, yes, didn't he? Yes, yes. And working all the while. Uh, I imagine, yes. Um, you became a premier dancer with the Marquise de Cuevas Ballet and the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo after yes. Colonel Basil's. Uh, there were two, uh, ba Ballet Russe uh, de Monte Carlo uh, of the Serge Denham Company that was very, very successful and lasted 25 years. Mm -hmm. It was the very first five years in his company and uh, ironically the very last five years of the existence of the company. With those companies you traveled all over the world. Oh yes, yes. I was about four or five times in South America throughout the United States. We used to have as many as 114 towns in six months. Just moving, moving, moving. Moving. But you well, in New York would be perhaps um, four or five weeks. And then in bigger towns like San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, would be maybe one week or 10 days. Otherwise, we had one night stands from, in, sometimes the entire month <laughs> would have nothing but one night stands. Did you have uh, any member of your family going with you, or did you just go with No, them? I yeah. was old enough. <laughs> <laughs> the women always had somebody with them, didn't well, they? Yes, <laughs> yes, they were chaperoned. <laughs> but I, you see, I had, I had nothing to lose. <laughs> the girls, perhaps. <laughs> did you choose what you wanted to dance in those? Uh, no, no. no. <laughs> when Mother decide, uh, said that she was going to take me to the school, I was petrified besides myself. I protested, but you know, in Europe, the relative's upper hand is the command. You um, danced, I want to show this picture because it's so fabulous, Afternoon of the Fawn. Yes, this was given to me at the end of the very first tour with Colon Colonel de Basile's company. Mr. Messine came to me at the Metropolitan Opera House and said that tonight you're dancing Afternoon of the Fawn. And I said, I don't know it. Yes, I saw David Lechine dancing, and it's not a very difficult role, but you have to create an atmosphere. You have to be artistic about it. It's not the steps that matter so much there. And he said, well, you come uh, later on, and I'll, I'll rehearse with you. And that evening, I danced at the Metropolitan Opera House that in fast? New York. That yes. fast? What about Sceptre de la Rose? <laughs> was it <laughs> no, the same? No, that was a little bit more demanding because that is a very difficult role. For about 12 minutes you're on the stage and if you're not leaping and spinning and doing beats and um, then you stay in a pose over your partner and you have to have your 
hands raised in movements, and believe me, it feels like lead. Those <laughs> hands just, they, you, you, you don't feel them anymore. You danced um, Swan Lake and Giselle as well. Yes, and uh, Sleeping Beauty and Raimonda, and uh, there were 19 ballets that were created on me by different choreographers. Who uh, was your favorite partner, say, for each one along, say, Swan Lake and then Giselle? Well, politically, one always <laughs> says the one that one dances with. But I remember dear Alicia Markova, she is so frail and she is so dainty and so lovely, so beautiful. But instead of going in kind of into the lift, you know, helping yourself, she'd sit in your hands. And then 95 or 100 pounds, you lift dead weight. <laughs> I'm sorry to confess, but it had to come sometime <laughs> or later in, in my life. <laughs> and, and then Baronova was the easiest one to lift, you know, in comparison from one to another one, Baronova that was way, you know, a few pounds heavier than Markova. She was like a feather. She was flying out of your hands. And that, it just depends on the dancer then? Yes, it depends on how the dancer uh, predisposes and how she helps you. And uh, others, uh, they say, well, you're a porter. You're, <laughs> you're my partner. You have to lift. What about uh, the choreography? Could you put your own feelings into the choreography, or did you have to stay very oh, strict? very much so, yes. Strict, yes. or? To me, the most important thing in choreography, li like Mr. Massine, would, uh, I have always terrible, ter terrible memory. Mr. Massine would create a choreography, and by the next day rehearsal, I'd forget half of it. Ah. So I'd improvise in his style, and either he said that I'm hopeless and will let me uh, go uh, away with it, or else he said, well, it looks so right if he, uh, and then let him do it uh, the way f he feels. So he wasn't so tied to what he uh, did, if no, his he dancer. No, he wanted to, to have the exact portrayal of the roles, and he'd show, and he'd be very precise, and, it, and he'd always say, this is very important, mm -hmm. you know, to underline uh, what you are doing, and uh, uh, he'd stress that. And then if you forgot it, would he forget it as well? Well, I, I, I really don't know. I, I never asked him because I'd be afraid. Oh. <laughs> and then <laughs> perhaps he'd look at me a little bit more careful and find that the errors was, and mistakes. That was a great mentor relationship for you with, with Mr. Massine, where he was very interested in your career. Do those type of situations happen today, or are dancers out by themselves? Somehow the dance has completely uh, changed. The approach to it, the feeling, the, it's, it's entirely different. I feel that uh, now choreographers are not that uh, close or, uh, or involved or interested in dancers. They let you do whatever you want. I wondered about that, but, but it's like uh, one person doesn't take a dancer and try to carry them along and work with them. Well, in Russia, they are very careful about it. See, like the old, older dancers like Plesetsky and Ulanova and Kalpakova from the Kirov Valley, they take under their wing, like Ulanova would take Maximova, uh, Katerina Maximova, ah. and coach her and give her details and work with her very carefully. That have maybe one or another dancer that give their knowledge exclusively to. That's what I wondered because Well, that's that why they're so great. You're going to write your memoir, as you said. Yes, I'm right in it, and my worst enemy is the computer. Oh! God. If <laughs> my memory was always poor, my computer work is even worse. Let's, do, let's show a couple of these pictures. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about them. And I'm sure they're going in your book. This is in Marquis de Cuevas' ballet, uh, uh, Grand Ballet. And it is the role of Inez de Castro. It's a very interesting role because he is in love, in love with Inez, but for the good of the state, his Portugal um, father, the king, wants to m 
him to marry uh, Infanta of um, Spain. And uh, he resents her because she is in love with uh, Inez. Then a uh, father makes them kill uh, the, uh, Inez. And then he revenges, he kills the man who killed Inez. And then he uh, crowns the, uh, he has a bowl. He sets the whole castle afire. <laughs> and then at the end of it, he presents the dead body of Inez that falls off. Well, I think and, you, and look, <laughs> you look very ominous well, in there that. Is, yes, there's <laughs> one even more petrifying picture. That is a very calm one. <laughs> Let's do, uh, very quickly, just tell uh, us what roles that these is, are. That uh, is Del Amor el, eh, La Muerte. Okay. It's uh, uh, tum, Tamar Tumanova. That was done for her and Skibin, I think. And then and this one? Well, that is when the king, uh, 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 oh. then Don Pedro gets crazy and he... I see. burns the castle, it presents the, his beloved and Inez. And our last one before we that leave? That is uh, Massin's, uh, Leonid Massin's uh, Rouge et Noir, and it's uh, with Nini Teladi. We have to go. We have John, to read. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have to read your memoirs. <laughs> well, I hope they'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> thank and you. And not too mean. <laughs> thank you, George Zorich, and thank you for being with us on Joan Quinn, etc. We'll see you next time.